today, my name is Sophie, and I'm a physical metallurgist. Metallurgy may be regarded as the oldest science, as can be seen in this diagram here, which maps the importance of different materials and engineering materials as a function of date. Some of the oldest ages of mankind are named after engineering metals, such as bronze and iron ages. This famous Rubens painting here shows us Hephaestus, who thought of an awesome Greek god of physical metallurgy as he was an awesome blacksmith. The alchemist, on the other hand side, had a somewhat different approach to physical metallurgy, and theirs was a bit more questionable. The relative importance of engineering metals and alloys peaked around the year 1950, following the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> Nowadays, some of the other engineering materials have caught up with metals and alloys. So why is it still exciting and important to be a physical metallurgist nowadays? I'm going to show you an example today. However, you'll have to hop on a plane and come back to my home country with me, to Austria. This is me in Austria <laughs> as a young girl before I decided to become a physical metallurgist. <laughs> And this is something the Austrians are really good at. The Austrians are good at making schnitzels. I guess you all know that. Today, I'm going to teach you a third fact you might have not known about Austria. The Austrians are awesome at hammer forging. They're awesome blacksmiths. At my company partner, Böhler Forging in Austria, the tradition of iron forging can be traced back all the way to the year 1446. So this is how it looked like back in the day, right? And this is how it looks like now, so pretty high tech. The product portfolio of Böhler Forging contains many forged products that go into aircrafts. And today, I want you to focus on this part here, the so-called engine disc. This is the most exciting and high tech part in an aircraft because um, these parts have to withstand very high temperatures and loads during a flight. The temperatures in the a combustion chamber where the aircraft engine disc sits um, is up to the, to the melting point of the engineering materials used here. So therefore, we need a special alloy, and it's called nickel-based super alloy, which is an alloy made out of nickel plus some additional elements such as iron, chromium, niobium, and molybdenum. Super alloy, the term super translates into very strong at high temperatures and under high loads in physical metallurgy language. So how can we make these engine discs? They are made by forging, which is a sequence of heating and bathing, as we call it. The actual production cycle at my industrial partner looks a bit more complicated, somewhat like this, a sequence of heating and bathing. So what happens to the inner structure of our alloys during forging? Let's go and join one of my physical metallurgy classes. So this little sketch here shows us how the nickel atoms are arranged in the crystal lattice of a super alloy. So they are quite densely packed together. Real engineering materials, however, are not perfect. They contain very many flaws, and one such important flaw can be seen here. It's a so-called dislocation, and you can imagine it as sort of a half plane of atoms that ends up somewhere in the crystal. The important thing is that we can transport these dislocations or half planes through the crystal. And you can imagine that as being somewhat similar to the motion of a little caterpillar here. This caterpillar, um, forms a hump at its back by lifting a few pairs of its legs. <coughs> and this hump is then propelled forwards. In physical metallurgy language, we call this plastic deformation. It's quite obvious that we want plastic deformation while we are forging. However, we do not want this to happen during a flight. That would be very bad. Therefore, we have to introduce very many different obstacles to dislocations into our material. And on the next slide, I'm going to explore some of these obstacles with you using correlative microscopy. We start with a slice from a real engine disc, and I'm going to compare the size of these individual features here to the width of human hairs to make it more accessible to anyone. So this scale bar here represents 3,000 human hairs. The first technique we're going to use is light optical microscopy. And with light optical microscopy, we can reveal obstacle number one, these tiny grayish, little bit parallel features. They are called twin boundaries. We can go on and use a scanning electron microscope and a technique which is called electron backscatter diffraction. With this technique, we can reveal the individual crystallites here. 
and the interfaces between these crystallites are obstacle number two, they're called grain boundaries. Using a different contrasting technique in the scanning electron microscope reveals these whitish particles. They are called delta phase and they are rich in niobium, obstacle number three. So let's explore the nanoscale of a super alloy using transmission electron microscopy. And please note the scale bar here. We are so much smaller than a single human hair. We can see that there's something going on in the nanostructure. However, it's a little bit hard to say what it actually is. Therefore, in my research, I use a quite amazing type of microscope. It's called the add-on probe. And I very often like to compare it to kind of a 3D material DNA test. So let's see what happens if we put our material into the add-on probe. So this is a 3D volume extracted from a real engine disk. So let's focus a little bit on the individual nano features we can see here once the video stops. So firstly, we can see the so-called gamma matrix. We can see particles, they're called gamma double prime and gamma prime. We can also see that these particles very often tend to show up in little triplets, so they don't really sit by themselves. So with this technique, we have now been able to reveal uh, the nano obstacles, um, these three that are listed here. And we've also been able to learn that they very often tend to show up in triplets. So how can we actually use that for making better nickel-based alloys? Let's go back to the production cycle as we do it at the industrial part. And you can see this blue dashed curve here, which is kind of like the standard process. So we've done this before. We have put such an engine disk into the atom probe. We've seen triplets. We can now measure the mechanical properties. And our key property is the so-called yield strength. So here we end up with 1,080 megapascal yield strength, which is quite okay. So using this knowledge, we can now go back and engineer the genome of this super alloy. We can make the process better. So let's just skip a step and make the process shorter. Let's see what happens then. Let's put such an engine disk into the add-on probe. Again, we can see triplets. However, we will want to measure the mechanical properties now. We end up with a yield strength of 1,300 megapascal. So we have won 20%, which is quite amazing. So clearly, something must be different at the nanostructure. What is it? So if you compare these little triplets, the stacking sequence is different. You may have grasped that. However, for those ones who have not been able to see that, I'm going to make it very easy. So I'm going to use something Austrian. So on the left-hand side here with the old process, we have a schnitzel burger, and we have a stacking sequence of bread roll, schnitzel, and bread roll. With our new process, we have been able to make the ultimate schnitzel burger that everyone wants, which is a sequence of schnitzel, <laughs> bread roll, and schnitzel. <laughs> and we have gained 20% in yield strength. So why does this matter? What's the impact inverse schnitzel burgers? Um, so firstly, and quite obviously, for my industrial partner, this means shorter processing time and better products and more money. That's quite clear. However, for the society and for everyone present in this room, it's quite well known that aircraft traffic is increasing, and it's expected to double within the next 15 years. So therefore, we need more fuel-efficient engines, and we also need to take very well care of the safety aspects. And for both these factors, we need stronger metals and alloys. Finally, for UNSW and for my research group, um, I hope I've been able to show that it's quite important to go out and uh, forge partnerships with industry. And this is even um, anchored in the university strategy. So just to briefly sum up, I hope I've been able to give you one example of the modern revival of the older science today using multi-scale correlative microscopy and with a, an amazing microscope called Atom Probe, we have been able to decode the atomic genome of an advanced metallic material. And with techniques like this, we can now build materials from scratch and make them better than ever before. Thank you. <laughs>